Uh, Archbishop Fulton Sheen was born 75 years ago in El Paso, Illinois, and became a priest in the Catholic Church just after the First World War. He is considered by almost everybody a great enigma. Those who like to disparage his evangelism have a difficult time accounting for his extraordinary academic record. Those who claim him as a conservative are continually amazed at his positions in behalf of statist welfareism. Those who have been inspired by his anti-communist lectures, which began in the early 30s, cannot understand his current calls for withdrawing from Vietnam. Archbishop Sheen has served as head of the worldwide department for the propagation of the faith. <clears throat> After that, he went dutifully to Rochester, New York, whence he has recently been delivered. In the early 50s, he began a network television show opposite Milton Berle, creating the scandal of the decade by beating Mr. Burl in the ratings, who subsequently reported ruefully that he had hired new writers, namely Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John. He is the author of 64 books. He is, in my opinion, the greatest preacher in English. Bishop Sheen is eloquently committed to the notion <clears throat> that whole nations have to pay a price to providence for their sins. He quoted recently from Abraham Lincoln, and I would like to ask him to explain what it was that A. Lincoln said, and B. what it was he had in mind in quoting Lincoln. Was it Lincoln's statement that uh, he never feared that America would perish from without, but that he feared that it would perish from within? That was Lincoln's statement. It wasn't the one that you quoted. I have it here if you want to uh, refresh your memory, although I was under the impression that you never needed to have your memory refreshed. <clears throat> oh, yes, I do. Well, that's not the one that I thought. When did I quote this? In 1967. Oh, yes. When I was talking about Vietnam. Yes. Well, uh, what Lincoln said was that the awful calamity of civil war which now desolates the land may be but a punishment inflicted upon us for our presumptuous sins to the needful end of our national reformation as a whole people. Or rather, he asked that question and then answered it by saying, intoxicated with unbroken success, we have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace, too proud to pray to the God that made us. It behooves us then to humble ourselves before the offended power to confess our national sins and to pray for clemency and forgiveness. Now, do I understand you to be applying Lincoln's theological analysis of what it was that brought on the Civil War to the existing situation? Is the Vietnam thing to be understood as a form of national tribulation which is in some way related to what we have earned? No, Mr. Buckley, I did not mean to imply that. I merely meant to imply that there is a moral order and that there is such a thing as retribution. Uh, nations have very much uh, gotten away from that. Uh, primitive people still retain it, but I certainly did not wish to, to say that it applied to Vietnam War. Uh, I had in mind, for example, uh, something that a missionary told me uh, some time ago about uh, uh, about an injustice that they had committed and that particular day they had stolen the missionary's axe and that particular day measles broke out in the camp and uh, simultaneously someone had sent a plane above the camp of the cannibals to see what had happened to the missionary and they said that's the evil spirit that sent us these red blotches, because we stole the missionary's axe. So these primitive peoples had a sense of retribution. I was saying that Lincoln also had a sense of retribution, but I did not mean to apply it necessarily to the Vietnam War, except every kind of war is a kind of, of a retribution upon the people. Can that be understood in an extra theological context? Almost in a physical context, for every action is a contrary and equal reaction, yes. Well, uh, could it be, as some, as some might argue, 
that a failure to prosecute the war in Vietnam might earn us a very considerable and more formidable retribution in the future. No, I would not mean to imply that. I no, would, I know you wouldn't. <laughs> no, because I certainly would not But how would, would you handle people who did? Well, mm. uh, first of all, uh, uh, this, was, this is a peculiar kind of war in which there was not really a great prosecution of the war. Uh, how different it was from World War II. What characterized this war, and here America must be very much credited, was restraint. Here we are, one of the great powers of the world. We take on an insignificant power. As far as explosiveness and so forth is concerned, we had far more than the enemy. Maybe the greatness of a man is often to be judged by his restraint of power. That was the great wonder of Christ, that having divine power, he used so little of it. And so America shows, shows and has shown great restraint in this war. Well, but is it always commendable to use restraint? Or, or is, it, uh, is restraint sometimes an expression of cowardice or lack of conviction? It can be both. Uh, first of all, uh, one may not show restraint in order to absorb evil. Take, for example, turning the other cheek. If there are ten men in a line and I preach hate to them and say, you must destroy your brother, and one man turns and strikes his neighbor, two strikes three, when will it ever stop? It will stop only at a point when one man turns around and absorbs the evil. In that sense, Restraint can absorb evil. From another point of view, restraint uh, does not absorb evil. It sometimes may, may increase it. Uh, the, the crime certainly on our streets today, the, um, the turn of law uh, by which there is compassion shown more for the mugger than for the mugged, more for the one who does the violence than for the victim. This is a kind of restraint which is not commendable and which I fear is bringing some trouble to our nation. Well, if you translate that into international terms, might it be argued that much too much international restraint is being shown towards those nations in the world which live by aggression and which preach uh, a, a hatred and whose uh, evil deeds might have been aborted, or whose careers might have been aborted a generation ago by the use of strategic power. You probably mean Russia, huh? Yeah. <laughs> no, I think that restraint is here commendable, uh, because I I'm afraid that any show of force would have brought retaliation, and it could very conceivably be the last war. But what when they were not in a position to retaliate effectively? I'm asking a very serious question, namely, uh, uh, is it a part of the Christian obligation in international terms to exert oneself when one can do so without bringing on apocalypse, uh, if it is predictable to reasonable men of active conscience that to do so at that moment will be to spare the world an ordeal tomorrow. For instance, a preemptive strike against Hitler in 1938 is now something that almost everybody wishes we had done, including you? Yes. Why then not say a preemptive strike against the Soviet Union in 1949? Well, now we're taking back the mentality of 1970 to 1949. And when we go back to that mentality, Russia was considered a democracy. Russia was considered on our side. I can remember 
uh, once giving a lecture in Youngstown, Ohio, on the fact that Russia was going to take over Eastern Europe. And some very high important person said, how dare you say that? This day is past. We live in a democracy. And in the 1949, that's what we were thinking about. I think, uh, uh, Archbishop Sheen, that you're a little bit, uh, a few years off, aren't you? Fulton, yes, Missouri, 36, Fulton right. Missouri was 46 yes. when the Cold War was declared. Right. And even the Democratic president had recognized it by 1949, indeed rather dramatically, with the Truman Doctrine and so on. So I, whereas I think it is true that the illusions you identify were widely shared in 1945, 44, 45, yeah. or 6. By 1949, the animosity of Stalin was pretty plain spoken. Yes, but I, I cannot look back and feel that we should have resorted to violence in those days. I think we would have brought a greater apocalypse upon the world. But you can as regards 1938. Yes, hypothetically, 1938. Uh, Bishop Sheen, you've, in your indictments of the American role in Vietnam, you have used the figure that it, in fact, is costing us something in the neighborhood of a million dollars per mm -hmm. death. Now, uh, that has had the effect on most people of saying, what, what a, a, an unspeakable war. It has exactly the opposite reaction on me, because it seems to me <coughs> that since everyone would agree that we have it within our power to kill people much more cheaply and don't, it does suggest that we are going out of our way to keep from killing people. If we are spending a million dollars per, per death of a single uh, enemy, then doesn't this suggest that the discriminatory apparatus that we are using is highly tuned? And isn't, isn't that a mark of civilization? First of all, what I said, that it was costing a million dollars a day. If there were 24 men, a million dollars an hour, mm -hmm. if there were 24 men killed in a day, mm -hmm. then it would be a million dollars a day. That was the statistic. Which is and not I far off, which is not far off. Yes. Actually, it's, it's, it's probably, uh, well, it's, it's, in, it's in the neighborhood of 200, yes. 300 people a week. Now, how are you going to turn that? Well, what I'm saying is, if, if we wanted to, uh, to kill more people, we could do so much more cheaply by Dresden-type bombings. Right. Our reluctance to do so, our failure to do so, it seems to me in terms of moral arithmetic, is, is praiseworthy. And under the circumstances, I have never understood the use of the high ratio of dollars per death as an argument pointing to the immorality of the war, but to the contrary. Yes. It was not so much to point to, just to the immorality of, the war, of this war, but rather to the immorality of war itself. What I was doing was to go back to figures that had been gathered by some historian about how much it cost to kill a man in different wars. For example, it is estimated that it cost Julius Caesar 75 cents a man. In World War I, it cost something like 20,000. In World War II, it cost 200,000. Then I adduce the figure that it cost a million dollars an hour in Vietnam. I was not speaking about moral arithmetic. I was just speaking about the terrific economic burden that is thrust upon mankind in virtue of fighting. So I would not, you're, you're very clever, however, to draw that conclusion that it was an evidence of our restraint, and I, I can see, see the value in the deduction, but that was not my purpose. But your, your purpose surely isn't to, uh, uh, isn't to illegitimize uh, war, is it? That is to say, you, do, do you not believe that some wars are defensible, in fact, some wars are imperative? Yes, I could see a reason for a defensive war yeah. if we were invaded. But well, then, therefore, it becomes a strategic question whether a particular war is a defensive war, correct? Yes. I mean, it becomes a theoretical question whether or not Vietnam does relate yes. to the defense of the right. And that, therefore, you, you would not uh, 
uh, criticize as a class those people who defend the Vietnam War? I certainly would not. Oh. However, you, you, you happen yourself to feel that the time is past when it is, when you would choose to defend it. Yes. And the statement that I made about it, Mr. Buckley, was about three years ago, when the statement was much more applicable than it is today. And furthermore, I was giving a Christian appraisal, not a political appraisal. And I was then speaking of what I had spoken of before, namely about the value of restraint, that I felt that if we gave up in Vietnam, we would have given a moral example to the world and perhaps would have won the moral opinion of the world. Three years later, it's impossible to do it. But we are withdrawing, and we're withdrawing to now at a time when it makes it possible for the world to conclude that we've lost our first war. Well, let me ask you, sir, if I may, in that connection, uh, uh, to what extent does a nation feel a corporate Christian uh, obligation to uh, step in in order to defend one's, one's brother, using the metaphor national terms? Suppose I put it this way. We, we suffer in America, I think it is accurate to say, some kind of a trauma as a result of our failure to go to the help of the Jewish people in Germany, who, as a result of our uh, defective reflexes, were, were practically wiped out as a people. Now, it, it seems to me that two things are plain from that experience. One, that we cannot bring them back to life. Uh, and two, that the purpose of reminding ourselves about uh, Buchenwald and the rest of it was to keep the conscience from going to sleep again. Now, <clears throat> if there is evidence that uh, a genocide uh, is continuing in other parts of the world, is this something concerning which we ought to be more active? Ralph Hawkworth writes a very successful play <clears throat> in Broadway which criticizes Pope Pius XII for his delinquency. Uh, I think historically inaccurate, in not moving faster to mobilize settlement in behalf of a rescue mission to the Jewish people in, Germ in, in, in uh, Germany. Now, will somebody be writing a play about us <clears throat> or about uh, the present pope for failure to mobilize settlement to re rescue, for instance, the Christians who are being exterminated in China? Yes, but given genocide, uh, given the extinction of Christians in China and in northern Vietnam, a million and a quarter of them brought down to the south, expelled, is war the only means? Are there not other means? One, of course, uh, is, is, is dialogue, which is not always successful. But I wonder if we, for example, did not begin to use, spend more of our money in helping people, maybe indirectly. We are seventh in the world in helping the poor of other nations. We are the richest nation in the world. We own six, we are only 6% of the world's population. We control 46% of the world's goods. Would it not be better if instead of all of this money spent on armaments, if we didn't come to the rescue of the people of, of China, northern Vietnam, the Catholics there, and the Jewish victims, in some other way than by war. I wonder well, if war today is not outlawed. Well, I think, uh, I think that that's a point uh, that an awful lot of very active people uh, worry about almost full time, but um, before we, we press that question, would it make sense to uh, acknowledge that America understands itself to be helping people by using as much money as America does on uh, armaments? For instance, uh, uh, to what extent does one value uh, freedom? Now, a lot of people we know value freedom even above life because people are constantly dying in behalf of freedom. In fact, the $80 billion that we spend 
uh, is, uh, can be interpreted as an act of international philanthropy since we are providing a shield not only for ourselves but, for instance, for Western Europe, for Canada, for Latin America, uh, and, uh, and therefore isn't that a form of philanthropy? Uh, here would be another way to put it. If you were, let's say, an Italian, would you prefer that America uh, continue to spend as much money as America is spending on armaments or spend less on that and more on direct uh, relief? For Italians, I should think that this would depend on the extent to which you understood the strategical situation and that you might very responsibly get down on your knees at night and thank the American people for accepting a great military burden which has direct philanthropic consequences. I do not wish to argue against that because I do not know all of the facts. But at the same time, I am mindful of the Maginot Line, where a tremendous military defense was built up which proved, from a military point of view, totally ineffective. And I believe, therefore, that the social approach... We just think if we spent the same amount of money that we're spending on armaments today to help the world, how much better we would be, how much better the world would be. Well, I think it would be much worse because... Uh, because the barbarians would be in complete control. Do you think that the people are better off in, in China because we didn't resist them, even though we had an opportunity to do so 20 years ago? Uh, it seems to me plain that most of, the, most of the misery of the world is the result not of natural conditions, but is the result of the active operations of, of governments which are administered by, by men. It took government to translate uh, Buchenwald uh, into uh, a Mein Kampf into Buchenwald. And under the circumstances, isn't America's unique challenge to accept the political uh, responsibility and the military responsibility? Yes, now, uh, I concede you have a point here, and a very good one. One, because governments have no eternal end. They have only a temporal end. And having such, they ha being such, they have to use temporal means in order to attain it. We simply cannot apply ideal social goods and Christian principles, Christians that have eternal ends, to the temporal ends of government. And I certainly would not want to be pushed into the corner of saying that there, that there, there should be no preparedness, any more than I would say we shouldn't have a lock on the front door. But it's, but a, I'm, it's I, a matter of balance. You yes. Mean. And you think that there is an imbalance in the existing yes, situation? Yes, I do. But isn't that caused rather by the Soviet Union than by us? I mean, are we redundantly protective? Do we have too many locks on the door? I don't know. That's a matter of, of fact and statistics. I wouldn't know. Uh, Archbishop, I wonder if I could ask you to, uh, to comment on something which uh, fascinates a lot of people, uh, non-Catholics, for instance, and distresses a lot of people, Catholics, for instance, which is the, the apparent erosion of, uh, of faith. I saw recently a statistic that uh, the church-going population of America has declined from 49% to 43% in the past 10 years, but that uh, whereas the, the Protestant slide has been about 15%. Uh, the Catholic slide has been more substantial. Now, I know there are those who wonder whether this is simply that we're all being manipulated by the zeitgeist or whether there is a causal relationship between the erosion of faith and the uh, uh, ecumenism of the Vatican Council. No, I should not say that ecumenism was the cause of the erosion. Certainly the zeitgeist is partly the cause, and very much the cause. From one point of view, Mr. Buckley, there probably was never before as much faith as there is today. Now, I'm putting faith in quotation marks. When God is disposed of, the gods arise. Faith today is taking the form of superstition. We have 2,200 newspapers, I believe, daily newspapers in the United States. 1,700 of them carry astrological columns. 
Was there ever such faith before in the stars as there is now? Uh, and as Shakespeare said, think of, the, think of the new face that are arising without any basis of credibility. As Shakespeare says, what damned error but some sober brow will bless it and approve it with a text. And so, on the one side, faith, without quotes, is indeed declining, partly on account of the zeitgeist. And on the other hand, it is increasing. The gods are multiplying. We have almost polytheism instead of monotheism. Well, could it, be, could it be, though, that the singular attraction of the Catholic Church over the years, namely its uh, dogmatic uh, constancy, uh, has now been so diluted as to cease to, to be singularly appealing to those people who were looking for um, a transcendent uh, uh, mooring and had... Uh, over a period of centuries, found it in the Catholic Church uh, in, in a way that they were able to justify rationally. Is this something that was surrendered during the 60s as a result of the ecumenical passions? I will arrive at your conclusion from a different premise. It's an old trick. <laughs> no, but it's definitely <clears throat> almost to supplement it. Uh, the, the Church... And Christianity has pretty much had a kind of a monopoly about God, and particularly the supernatural. It aggrandized to itself this divine order and kept the natural order outside. So our distinction between the two was quite rigid and severe, with the result that the natural order, the political social order, had to find its own deities, develop its own religions, a naturalism, a humanism, an existentialism. Scientism. Scientism, pietism, whatever you please. At the Vatican Council, which I attended, one did not find any discussion of that rigid distinction between the supernatural and the natural order. In other words, we are today paying a price for a kind of a monopolistic theological capitalism. Well, is it, um, uh, is it a price that uh, in, in fact yields to the very, very old passion of many people to immanentize the eschaton? and to uh, utopianize uh, the world? Are, are we, in, in, in fact, attempting, attempting really a secular idealism to which much of religion has, has, has shrunk? Yes, the secular, of course, has indeed a great appeal today. Uh, but there's a reaction against that. Who is more dead today than Harvey Cox's secular city? Because the secular city didn't turn out to be quite as idealistic as Harvey Cox thought it was. And even in this secular order today, look at those who are trying to find hope. Uh, for example, uh, Jürgen Moltmann, the Lutheran German theologian who has written uh, so much about hope, says that he went into, um, into Prague one day to attend a communist congress. And he picked up a copy of Time. And on the cover, God is dead. He went to the Communist Congress. The programs had already been printed weeks before, and the title was, God is not dead, quite dead. Then he went to a, a Communist Congress in Marienbad in Czechoslovakia, where there were Protestants and Catholics and Communists in discussion. All of the Protestants and the Catholics talked about the necessity of the church getting into the world. Immanentism, involvement, secularism. What did the communists talk about? Transcendence. Mm -hmm. 
And now even time has changed its cover. God is dead. Yes, he might not be, right? He might, may not be quite dead. Abby Hoffman says God is dead and he did it for the kids. There are those who do wonder um, about um, the, the apparently infinite capacity of the Catholic Church to, uh, to coexist with heresy, or as a matter of fact, apostasy. Francis McMahon, the theologian, has referred to the to imminent uh, apos, uh, apostates, his point being that, uh, in, incidentally, I, I should say that he's a very liberal theologian and uh, has been, over the years, identified with what one calls left-wing causes, but all of a sudden he has become uh, Mr. Orthodoxy, and he says uh, that the Pope uh, ought, to, uh, uh, ought to affirm uh, Catholic dogma by excluding people from the church, by excommunicating them, who in fact plainly refuse to, uh, to subscribe to the basic articles of, of, of faith. And there is a considerable question why that in fact doesn't happen, or is this an expression of, of charity in mid-century mode? It's too bad that he didn't read the parable about the cockle and the wheat. <clears throat> Remind us what that says. Well, the wheat was sown by the farmer, and during the night the enemy came and sowed the cockle. And it was suggested that the cockle be torn up. And the Lord said, no, you will also destroy the wheat. Let both grow until the harvest. We must remember that the church is not just made up of saints. It's made up of sinners. And if it were made up for saints, there wouldn't be any room for me. We wouldn't want that. Do you mind if I go on water power as well as wind power no, for sir. a while? Mm. Well, uh, do, I, do I understand that this, the situation today is different, uh, Archbishop, from what it was during those other periods in religious history when it was thought that the act of excommunication was actually an affirmation of uh, Christian solidarity which was strategically necessary and even strategically kind? Is the situation different now from when, let us say, the Manichaeans were, were uh, excommunicated? Yes. Uh, I mean, apart from the obvious differences. Uh, there, well, remember, excommunication holds only for those who have the faith. Mm -hmm. It does not hold for those who have not. Remember how many appeal to Pius XII to have him excommunicate Hitler. What good would it do to excommunicate Hitler? So we're living in entirely different times today. No, but Hitler it, never pretended to be a Catholic. No, well, that's precisely <clears> what <throat> I'm saying, that you cannot use excommunication with those that have not the faith. No, but I'm talking about people who do pretend to be Catholics. Uh, for instance, the gang who runs the National Catholic Reporter, uh, uh, incidentally an organization which I sponsored when it uh, when it was founded. Uh, but in any, in any case, uh, I should think that they couldn't get past the second phrase of the Apostles' Creed without gagging. And the question is, uh, uh, oh, I mean, who runs this joint, they or the Pope? And, and I should think that uh, a pretty good argument for, for salvaging any meaning at all to Christianity is to insist that there is a distinction between, let's say, Mao Zedong and yourself and that if Mao Zedong claims to be a Catholic, there's got to be somebody around who says, no, he isn't. Does that follow? Yes. Now, what conclusion are you going to draw? Well, I'm, I'm asking you why the present pope 
doesn't excommunicate anybody. I, we excommunicate a couple of people who refused integration down in North Car South Carolina, come think of it, or New Orleans. They were suspended, ago. yes. Susp yeah. Oh, they're excommunicated. Really? I know, because he told me, Leander mm -hmm. Perez told me he was excommunicated. Incidentally, you'd be glad to know that he sneaked away to Mississippi to go to church on Sunday. Yes, I know that. Which is, which is nice. But uh, 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 my point is that why uh, in mid-20th mid century is the act of excommunication not invoked, whereas it has been invoked throughout history. Uh, Tyrell was excommunicated for far lesser offenses than are recited every day in Commonwealth yes. magazine. Right. And I'm asking you to explain that to me. Well, again, it's a change of the, of the spirit of the times. I think the church uh, has become much more patient and kind. It's more related to the world than it was then. The church was very much locked up in itself. After all, what the Vatican Council did was to relate us to the world. First of all, in the Vatican Council, the world came into the church, and the church went out to the world. But did it? Yes. Well, then why doesn't it follow that more people welcomed it, that more people go to church, more people uh, take vocation and study to become priests and nuns? It's going to take a long time for the yeast to work through the dough. But there was the... Uh, for example, in Vatican Council I, there was not one single bishop from Asia or Africa in 1870. Not one. In the Vatican Council II, 61% of the bishops were from Americas, Asia, and Africa. So that the church has become much more related to the world. Being related to the world, I think, has become much more compassionate of sinners. And I would say that perhaps that is the spirit that has changed us from the rigidity of excommunication to the patient bearing of offenses. Well, <clears throat> would you describe to me an excommunicable offense? I would say a willful and deliberate desecration of the Blessed Sacrament, the breaking of the seal of confession. Well, this would, of course, apply to a priest. That's right. But uh, for a layman. Again, desecration of the Blessed Sacrament could apply to him. And is it possible to desecrate the Blessed Sacrament by, let us say, uh, participating in a black mass? That would depend upon the degree of participation and the degree of proof. It's going to be very difficult to prove any participation in the black mass. If an individual uh, says, I cannot believe in the divinity of Christ, is that an excommunicable statement? No. The church would not excommunicate a man for saying that. It would not be a true statement, but it would not be excommunicable. Mr. Greenfield. Um, going back to what you were discussing earlier, um, I get a sense in recent days of a kind of much sharper separation between what, what I used to think of as religious conscious, conscience and the so-called real world, the natural world. And I, I think of it in political terms, I have to admit. Um, it seems that most Americans are more upset by the fact that, for instance, newspapers discussed what happened in Song Mi in Vietnam, the killing of women and children, than they are about the actual episode that American soldiers allegedly, uh, almost certainly, uh, gunned down women and children in cold blood. A sense that almost that we've come to a point in America where if we can dehumanize other people enough, we don't really care what happens to them, whether we call them Black Panthers or whether we call them dinks or gooks in Vietnam. Um, do you think that perhaps at some risk to itself that the church might have to begin reaffirming, if not the Christianity, at least the humanity of, of people that we don't like to think of as very pleasant people, say communists or Black Panthers or or radicals? No, I'd agree with you absolutely. Because, one, there is a great potential, even in the enemies. Take, for example, Paul. When Paul was persecuting the church, within five, five or ten years after the resurrection, I am sure that there must have been thousands of Christians who were praying that the good Lord would send a good case of coronary thrombosis to Paul. Get rid of this enemy. 
Here was a learned man. The rest of the men were all fishermen, except the one man who came from, from Judea, who was on the right side of the tracks, namely Judas. Here was a learned man, and they must have said, send somebody to answer Saul. And God said, all right, I'll send somebody to answer Saul. I will send Saul. So in answer to your question, I agree with you, yes. We must get back to the human and uh, to see the divine image in everyone. Do you think, and in more, just to follow that up, in more immediate terms, that it might, in fact, be necessary for the church to take some rather unpopular positions when it does, in fact, reaffirm the humanity of people who other people... Almost every position the church takes today is unpopular. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Sinkowitz. I've noticed lately um, a lack of the idea of community worship in the average parish church around somehow the, the satisfaction of worshiping together like the early Christians had seems to be missing in a rather perfunctory I have to go to mass on Sunday kind of kind of thing. And um, at a lecture by Clive Barnes that I attended recently, he mentioned an interesting idea that um, religion used to serve the purpose of this community gathering and that now that this is passing, people are looking for that in other things, the, the football game type fraternity spirit, the, uh, the rock concert, and things like that. Do you think that this lack of community spirit could be a reason for the decline in attendance at church that Mr. Buckley was speaking of? Yes, it could in part. But something to remember, Miss, is that the world is always on a teeter-totter. And yeah, just as in literature, we had one moment, the classicism of Dryden, then we got into the romanticism of the late poets. So in religion, we had too much emphasis on the individual, complete neglect of the community. Today, we got a cry for community. We must all get together, boys and girls. And this, indeed, has to be emphasized. Now it is being so emphasized, we've got to keep balance that the individual is alone, too. That he's also got to save his own soul, as well as saving the community. That while there must be much more relevance in the world, we also have to have considerable irrelevance. Because there are some things we think about in our own heart that have relations to the transcendent. And there must be a place for this. We cannot, we cannot so emphasize the community that we're like a drop of water in a glass of wine, absorbed in even a spiritual kind of totalitarianism. And, and uh, while this has to be stressed, I'm only saying, watch the balance. Let's not go overboard with communism and forget that there's such a thing as the individual. Mr. Burr. I'd like to uh, talk about a problem that I think uh, the church has found itself related to, and that's the urban crisis that we have right now, and certainly we're all aware of it. And uh, recently, there's been talk about the church's non-commitment to that crisis, and I think we have examples of it in all the cities, and uh, one problem that relates to property that the church owns. Uh, let's take the property that isn't specifically a church or a rectory, but that is used for private enterprise, uh, that is not taxable. Do you think that uh, the church uh, in a similar way that you talked about the government before should make a recommitment, a monetary commitment to involve itself in the city? Because it would seem to me, uh, in relation, for example, to the extent of land that the church controls in the District of Columbia, that there is a lot of good tax money that is certainly necessary to feed, house, and run the city that seems to kind of trickle away and that people never get a hold of. That's a very good question. There are two, really, two points to your question. Uh, one is the church and its relatedness to property, and the other is the church and its relatedness to the ur urban problem. First of all, as regards property, uh, the church doesn't have nearly as much wealth as is generally assumed. But as regards property, which you mentioned, I think that we must make a distinction, one, between that which is used for religious purposes, like schools and churches. <coughs> Two, that property which will be used within a period of three or five years for religious and social purposes. And thirdly, property that was not within the planning of three to five years. That, I think, should be on the tax roll. That for property. Now then, as regards the urban crisis, it's rather popular to say that the church is not interested in the, in the urban crisis. I, 
I came from a diocese where we paid $639 a day to just the urban crises of one city alone, $639 a day, seven days a week, where simply because there was nothing being done for housing, we went out and bought 19 houses for blacks that had families and they were living in impoverished conditions. Unfortunately, the church has no megaphone and has not been able to express all that it is doing for the urban crisis. And then it's not to be forgotten that in one place there was an attempt to give away a church and a school and everything else in order to start housing for the poor, and the poor man was knocked on the head, whoever he was. <laughs> <clears throat> Greenfield. I was going to ask you about uh, whoever this man was, um, because it, it was an impression, uh, uh, Mr. Buckley, with, with, with uh, sorrow and myself with some happiness, uh, share it, that, that you began your public career uh, in a reasonably orthodox uh, tradition. tradition, okay, political and, and theological, and that, uh, and that in recent years, particularly up in Rochester, there seemed to be a a, a shift of direction into this kind of, of activity that you described. And I wonder um, if you could just, if it's a fair question, to tell us what, what led you to that, to that decision that you were First, going to you're, take. First, you're assuming that I'm an entirely different clock at 6 o'clock in the morning and 9 o'clock at night. No, just the I am the not. Morning. Actually, the change was not in me. The change was in what was outside. The sun shines upon wax and softens it, it shines upon mud and hardens it. And the seeming change in character is often due to the environment that surrounds him. I was no different. Well, there were hungry and poor people in the 50s as well as the 60s. Listen, there's a great deal of difference, my dear Mr. Greenfield, between the poor of uh, 50 and the poor of today. And this is something of which we have to take cognizance. They're angrier. Yes, but today, the big difference is the poor today know they are mm -hmm. poor. That's the great difference. The secret. You mentioned that the church is trying to change with the change of the spirit of the times, but that it'll take time, like waiting for yeast to go through dough. But so many parishes low on church on the local level seem to be living in the past, where the, you have a, a pastor who keeps on preaching that dances are horrible, terrible things that are leading the, you know, the, the children away and that girls should stay in the home and things like that. This kind of thing seems to me to be alienating the youth and that the time that it's going to take for this yeast to spread through the dough is, is just not going to be soon enough and that so many people are being lost. What can be done about things like that? Well, first of all, I think there are very, very few priests who would be opposed to dancing. <laughs> I. I don't know any in any case. But you are quite right in saying that there should be a change. But something to remember is this. You cannot put a bomb under a baby and make it a man. There is the seed, and then there is the nourishment. All, all great permanent changes, most great permanent changes, that involve life demand time. We live in an age of immediacy. It's got to be aspirin immediate relief. Listen to the clock tick. If you'd only taken that aspirin five seconds before, now you wouldn't have a headache. Now you're all smiles because you took it a little early. Instant coffee. Everything has to be instant. And then it's instantly forgotten. So I agree with you. I'm always trying to strike a balance. I would agree with you in saying that, no, we're beyond those who take this position that there should be no dancing and so forth. But on the other hand, we, we, we must allow for a certain amount of growth. I asked uh, Archbishop a guide uh, in Seville a few years ago how they were getting along without Cardinal Segura, who had died a month or so before, and she replied very piously, well, since the Cardinal died, 
he and we have passed on into a better world. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a nice way of saying it. Uh, Mr. Bird. Yes, uh, pursuing uh, that last question, uh, it seems to me that, that one of the beauties and the strengths of religion is, is oftentimes tradition, the good parts of the traditions, and certainly we have to make that uh, distinction. But uh, in viewing such things as the folk mass and the jazz mass, and all these attempts that it seems to me various factions of the church have made to get into it, uh, but they've kind of petered out, and, and maybe that uh, these things form a percentage of that drop in church attendance, and I was wondering how you feel about that. You mean there's a decline in the folk mass and so forth? Well, my, my, my personal feeling is that it, it really, not that it's not appropriate, but that it's not effective and that uh, it's the traditional thing that, that really is the strength of religion, the, the, the attempt one yeah. makes to grasp. Uh, uh, I was surprised to hear you say that because I have heard uh, some evidence, too, that there has been a decline. Now, as regards your, your uh, expression of tradition, tradition is a memory. Law has precedent. An individual without memory is suffering from amnesia. A church, a nation that has not a history, is apt also to be without memory. So no, children are born into the world to give us novelty. There are old people that are born into the world to remind us that there is such a thing as a heritage. And again, we have to keep both together, the nova and the vetera, the new and the old. And do you think that the dissatisfaction with the folk mass is related to what Mr. Burrs said, that people are discovering that they did not go there for that kind of experience of just a few seconds? I'm not so sure he could answer that question better than I could. I'm afraid he doesn't have time. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you all. Thank you, members of the panel. Uh -huh.